lots of people not, not here this morning, but I'm glad you're here because this is a very important message. Very important message uh, that I just want to share from my heart. It's called perspectives. It's about how we view things. You know, things that we often allow some views in our minds to hold us back. Like people have so many views that are so wrong uh, or not accurate. And we, we are not here to judge people. But they allow these things. Oh, I thought Christians should be like this. Like I deal, oh, by the way, we are starting our fourth service in Klang, fourth service this evening. So that's a Punjabi. Do you say Punjabi or Punjabi? Pun. Pun. It depends if you want to curse them or love them. You know, you're a Punjabi or you're a Punjabi. So anyway, we've got this group that's coming now to our church. All of them are like barbers and hairdressers and, and tailors and all these kind of people that want to come to our church but were so shy until they met Pastor Kasif downstairs. So it's our fourth service that they are starting on a Sunday. So they've got the Urdu service at 8 and then at 10 o'clock to 12 midnight, they've got the Punjabi service that's happening. So that's cool. I'm preaching tonight as the opening of that service. So they are combining both the Urdu and the Punjabi service together and they expect over 100 people to be there. So that's very exciting, very exciting. Uh, we all have those moments where we realize something and we go like, oh, I see. Because uh, previously we didn't see it like that until we get a change of our perspective, a change of our view. Oh, now I know what, what you meant, you know. How many of you got that aha moment, that oh, I see moment? Right, now that you told me about it. You know, uh, like Indian people are the worst people in the world, and then, then you, you met people like Leon, and you say, they're not that bad. Oh, Indian people are quite nice. Oh, I see. They're really nice people. They're very intelligent, good-looking, and they're, they're not all drunkards and gangsters. All right. So you all, we all have those moments. And I want to read to you from <clears throat> what Steve, Stephen Covey, who's, who wrote the book, uh, wrote the very, very fantastic book called The Seven Effective Habits of Successful People. And this is what he said. Let me read to you, and I quote from that book. He said, I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one morning on a subway in New York. People were sitting quietly. Some were reading newspapers. Some were lost in thought. Some were resting their eyes um, with their eyes closed. It was a calm and a peaceful scene. Then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway. The children were so loud and Rumbacus, rumbac, rumbacious, that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's newspapers. It was very disturbing. And yet the man sat next to me and did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive as to let his children run wild like that and do not, nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else on that subway felt irritated too. So finally, with that, I felt I was unusually patient and, I, and restrained. I turned to the man and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little bit more. The man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. You see, we just came from the hospital where their mother just died an hour ago. I don't know what to think, and I guess I don't know how to handle this situation either. Can you imagine how I felt, Steve Covey writes, at that very moment, my paradigm shifted. Suddenly, I saw things differently. And because I saw things differently, I thought differently. I felt differently, and I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died, I said. I'm so sorry. Can you tell me about it? What can I do to help? So everything changed in that one instant. Everything can change when we look at things differently. When we open our eyes to see the things 
the way God sees things. And the first step of having our perceptions change from negative perceptions to what God wants us to feel is to open our eyes and be willing to see things differently. Some of us today might be held back because some of the views we have had for a long time. I thought Christians are supposed to be doing this. I thought you're not supposed to be doing that. Why I like hanging out with new Christians is because many of them, um, they, they treat people as human beings, not as Christians and non-Christians. Did you get that? And I like it because new Christians, they, they don't say, well, you know, uh, they've been stuck in Christianity for so long that they are fixed in their minds. This is right, this is wrong. But new Christians are not like that. They feel that these are human beings. I need to think and look differently. Don't think Christian or non-Christian. Think that they are made in the image of God, equal to you. The only reason why you have access to God is because God, by His grace, saved you. That's all. It's the grace of God. That's why, that's, that's why you are who you are. I'm who I am by the grace of God. Paul kept t telling the people, you need to renew your mind. And this is one of the standard important issues in Christianity. He says, be renewed in your mind. Learn to change the way. Allow the Word of God, allow the Holy Spirit to adjust your thinking. Take away that paradigm that we have of what a Christian should be and see how God sees things. Are you following me? Yeah, because like when I deal with Chinese in our church and Tamil in our congregation and here we have Africans and other uh, people from different countries. And, and then you've got the, the people who come from Pakistan and, and their mindset, their, their religious mindset. And then now, of course, we're starting our Punjabi service. Their mindset is just, that's the way they were brought up. And so they, they look at people with, with a lot of prejudices. And that's why we, we thank God for the Bible. So whenever we want to say, look, is this a right way for me to think? Go back to the Bible. You'll never fail. You never can go wrong. Go back to what the Word of God says. And I'm not just saying you quote scriptures, but you see the Spirit in what God is saying. If you love the Word of God and you study the Word of God, you'll, you'll get God's mind and how He thinks. So Jesus came 2,000 years ago and He said to people, guys, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It challenged their, their, their paradigm, their mindset. Because God is not African. God is not Malaysian. God is not an Englishman that speaks with an English accent from the King James Version. So a lot of us who became Christians started speaking quite English. And even in our prophecies, we prophesied as if God was a Shakespearean person. Yea, yea, I say unto thee, the Lord thy God speaketh this day to thy soul. Bless the Lord. We don't know how to talk and be natural. I mean, God must be sitting there and thinking, why do you sound so strange? Why can't you be normal? See, so Jesus came and he started doing things that challenged. In fact, they killed him because he said, you've seen the Father. If, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is exactly how your Jehovah God is. Not like how the Pharisees are doing religion. Nah, -uh, that's not God. They talk about God. They are easy to quote chapter and verse from the Torah. They are easy to point out people who are sinners and those who are righteous according to their standard of righteousness. But Jesus said, watch me. If you see me, you've seen God. This is a scripture I get stuck in all the time because I travel a lot and I speak in a lot of churches. I don't want to be judgmental. But I'll always say, if Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible that we are worshipping, sinners will be attracted to our church. Amen. They won't be repelled from our church. Righteous people, self-righteous people won't like our church. Sinners will be drawn. Luke 15, I love this verse. This is the theme of my life. So sometimes people say, how could you sit with that person? And you know, how could you talk with people like that? In Luke chapter 15 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners were drawn near to him. 
I mean, put that in your spirit. How is it Jesus was so attractive that we Christians are not attracting non-Christians at all? So you find the older you become a Christian, the lesser non-Christian friends you have, and that's a shame. That's a, that's a disgrace. Disgraceful. Non-Christians should like you because of the Jesus in you. They shouldn't be repelled from you. Everybody okay so far? So that's why you, you wonder why your pastor loves to hang out with non-Christians more than Christians. <laughs> huh? They'll ask me, do you know about this song? I don't know. Do you know about that person? Do you know about this thing that's going on? Do you know about that? I don't know a lot of stuff that goes on in Christianity. I know a lot of stuff that's going on in the non-Christian world. That doesn't mean I'm not a Christian. I'm not proud to be a Christian. Of course I am. I love the Lord. and I love His church. and I'm loyal to the church. But I want to see the people who really need Jesus. Because there are a lot of Christians who don't need God. They, you know, they're, 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 they're saved. They're going to heaven. But there's no passion in their heart for the lost and for people outside of God. And so it, it tells us here in Luke 15 verse 1 and 2. It says they were drawn to hear him. They came near to him. They, they, they felt comfortable with Jesus. And I want people to feel comfortable in the culture of our church. Because when we worship Jesus, the attractiveness of Jesus should draw people, not draw them away. That they should come and find hope in this place. So he talks about, and we all know this chapter, we all know Luke 15. He talks about three stories. He talks about the parable of the, 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 the woman who lost one coin, she had ten. And Jesus is talking and the audience is listening. And he's saying, and the, and the woman went all out to sweep the house. She stirred up all the dust to find that one lost coin in her collection. When she found it, she called her neighbors and she rejoiced. He says, in likewise, same way, he's telling the story, when one sinner gets saved, all of heaven rejoices. Then he goes to the next story. He says, this man had a hundred sheep, but one of his sheep got lost. And he went all out to find that sheep. He left the 99. He went all out to find. And when he found that sheep, he came home and he threw a party. And he said, likewise, Jesus is telling the story. He says, likewise, when one of you sinners come back to God, all of heaven rejoices. Heaven loves it. They celebrate when one person comes back to God. You may have been far away. And the audience sitting there were sinners and tax collectors but there were also Pharisees. And then he tells a third story. He said a father had two sons, and the son did the most unthinkable thing in his day and even today. He said to his father, I wish you were dead. Basically, he said to his father, why well, are you still alive? You know, I wish you were dead, but give me my property anyway. I can't wait for you to die. I want my property. I want to go on. So imagine the audience listening to that. And so many of them can identify with that. That's horrible. And then Bible, Jesus says he went out and he lived riotously. And he spent all his money and he ended up in a pigsty. Oh, for the Jews, that's terrible. He tells that story. And he says then one day he comes to himself. He repents. And he says, I'll go back to my father. And he comes back. And Jesus tells the story. And people are probably bawling their, their, their eyes out because they can imagine themselves. When they come back to God, God doesn't say, you've been bad. You've been... So he changes the paradigm. People's mindset of God, he completely changes it. And he says, the father runs to meet him. And the son is going through his recital. Oh, father, I've seen... He doesn't even want... The father doesn't even want to listen to this boy's repentance. He just embraces him unconditionally, loves him, kisses him, hugs him. That's your father. That's how God is. He's a running, jumping, hugging, kissing daddy. He forgives you. He has chosen to forgive you a long time ago. So Jesus changes the paradigm. He says, but there's an older brother there as well. And the older brother, of course, he's self-righteous. I didn't live like my younger brother who went out to sin. So the Pharisees are sitting there and they are getting their medicine now. And so he's telling the story. And when he finishes chapter 15... Just when the Pharisees are walking away, he starts off. And that's where you go to chapter 16, which I want to talk about. He doesn't say to them, wait, 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 I haven't finished the story. He starts saying loudly, there was once a rich man. And this rich man had a manager. And his manager was swindling him behind his back. All the Pharisees stopped. Because if you read the chapter, it says that the Pharisees outwardly showed that they were very righteous, but they were crooks when it comes to money. And Jesus now changes the scene again. And this manager had been taking money from his boss, 
And one day his boss found out that he had been cheated by his property manager. And he basically tells the guy, I'm going to fire you. But before I fire you, I want you to bring in the books, bring in the ledger, and I'm going to check everything, and then you will be fired. And this manager thinks to himself, and you can read it for yourself. He says, oh my goodness, you know, I, I've always been working in the air-conditioned office. I can't go out and work in the hot sun. Look at my hands. They're so nice. No calluses on my hand. I, I can't go out and dig and work and work like a laborer. I can't do that. I'll die. And I, 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 I'm too ashamed to go out and beg for money. So what will I do? So he realizes, listen carefully, he has a short time and an opportunity to do something. And so Jesus continues the story, and all of them are listening to him. Pharisees come sit down. He said, this man says, well, I think what I'll do is I will go to all the people who owe my boss money, and I'll say to them, how much do you owe the boss? And this person says, well, a hundred bushels of wheat. He says, never mind, what do you do? Cut, just cut it off and say you owe only 50. All right? I'm giving you a discount. Wow. This guy is so good. Thank you. You know, next time, if you need anything, I, I, I'll help you, the, the, the worker says. So he cuts off on, on, the, on the bill, uh, 50. He only owes 50. 50 he doesn't have to pay. And then he goes to somebody else. How much do you owe the boss? And he says, well, I owe the boss this X amount of oil. He says, cut it off. Cut, cut 80% off. Just say you owe the boss 20%. Wow. You are so kind. I'll never forget you. If you need anything, don't worry. You will, you'll hear from me uh, very soon because one day I will need help and you will help me. Now, the master finds out that this fellow had been shrewd. Are you following the story so far? I'm not reading to you the whole Bible because you can read it yourself. The master finds out that this fellow is shrewd and he goes to him and he puts his arm around him and compliments him. Why does he compliment this fellow who has been cheating him? So was, was the master saying to be shrewd is good? Was he saying that if you are crooked, that's smart? Was Jesus trying to send that message to all the people who are listening about this story and about money? No, he was saying that this man knew that while he had an opportunity, he could do something with it. And while he had limited time, he could do something with finances. Then Jesus goes on to say, and watch his words, Jesus goes on to say, the children of the light are not as wise as the children of the world. In other words, he's saying, if you really say that you believe in God, I believe, I believe we sang just now, Lord, I need you. If you really say, see, the people of this world the only thing they can think of is everything that they have, all the money, all the work, everything that they do is for here because they don't believe in life after death. So if you are a sinner, that's the way to live. I mean, give it all you've got, cheat, do whatever you can because there's no accountability when you die because non-Christians don't believe. One day I'm going to see God and I'm going to give an account to God. So Jesus was saying, well, the children of this world, because that's their, their view of this world, their, their, their perception of life is here and now. But you people who believe that there is life after... How many of you believe that there's life after death? Some of you, not sure. There's no proof for it, Pastor. Huh? Anybody from the dead came back and spoke to us? Well, Jesus did. So his point was very clear. He's saying to each and every one of us, you have a short time and you have a certain amount of resources, right? We don't compare your salaries in church, but you have some resources. Some of you are blessed, you've got jobs, praise God. But every Thursday you come up and you pray, please pray for me that I will get a, a promotion and, and I will get more finances. And we do. We do. But what is your perception about wanting to be promoted and blessed and prospered? What is the reason you want more money? What are you going to do with it? Now, 
It's a good thing. Please, don't get me wrong. But I want you to understand three things today. If you take, it, take something away from here. Number one, money is a tool. It's a tool. It's a gift from God. And I pray each Thursday and every day, whenever I think of you and sometimes your ugly face has come up in my mind, I pray for you. Father, bless them. Make them the head, not the tail. You're children of God. You're Christians. You're God's people. You are the salt of the earth, the light of this world. You are important to this world. But even as good as you are, you've got a short opportunity. I hope you'll be smart. That's why he said the people of this world are smarter than the people of the light. At least they know how to multiply themselves and make friends because in case they're in trouble, their friends will help them out. But he says, you people who know God ought to be learning from this so that you use your time and your opportunity to win people who might one day say, as Joni was sharing just now, every time you give, we are sowing into somebody. We are starting all these services. We are getting our buildings being bought and paid for. And it's a struggle. But every time there is a challenge for us to give, and I'm thinking about how are we going to build this next building that we have a property now in, in a, what's the place called? Rimbayu. We've been given this land and we need to build it for two and a half million or three million. We don't even have nothing. But why are you stressing yourself to go and do all these things? So that we can win people and put people in the house of God yeah. till the last breath that we have, that's what we will be doing. Yeah. Okay, you understand? So uh, when, we, when we think of prosperity, when Stella and I think of our personal prosperity, Lord, if you bless us, I tell you, I promise that I will be a blessing. You bless me and watch me, God, I will be a blessing. So the first thing we need to understand that, and Jesus says it, he who is faithful in a little is also, in verse 10, he who is faithful in a little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Now look, listen carefully. Let's say how much, how much you have in your bank. Not my business, not my job to find out. I don't care. But from heaven's perspective, ah, wait up in heaven, when God looks at your money, no matter how much you have, like I've got money in my pocket. This is a rare thing. Normally it's gone. My wife would have taken it. But <laughs> now it, Maybe if I have a big bundle of it here, from God's perspective in heaven, no matter how much you might have, it looks very small. Am I correct? It looks so small. So whether you've got one buck, one dollar, or whether you've got a hundred bucks in your hand, from way up in heaven, it looks very small. The house that you live in, you might think it's really cool and classy, but from way up in heaven, it looks very small. Of course, God can see it, but I'm just saying. And that's where you, you said you want to spend eternity, right? You want to spend eternity with God, right? What you got is so small. It's nothing. I've never, and I've passed being a pastor now for 42 years. I've never, and I've done many, many funerals. I've never done a funeral or went to a person who was dying. In the last breath, they were saying, I, I wish I had bought that car. Now I'm dying. It's too late. I, I wish I'd finished that renovation. You know, I wanted to do it so much. I wanted to make that extension where I could sit down. I wish I had made that. You think anybody who was dying ever said things like that? No, not one. They're all holding on to the bed or holding on to the nurse's hand or their wife's hand or somebody's hand and saying, I wish I had more time. I wish I had more. So Jesus was changing the per perception and the perspective of the people of his day. And especially the Pharisees, if you read that chapter, you'll find later on the Pharisees were, they, they berated him, they scolded him, they cursed him because they loved their wealth. But in front of people, they all appeared to be very kind, very generous. They wanted eternity, they talked about God, but their lifestyle, Jesus spoke clearly to their lifestyle. That's who you really are. And they hated him for it. 
and he speaks to us today. Money is just a tool. He contrasts worldly riches with true riches in that chapter when you go home and read. He says, there are people who are filled with anxiety about worldly riches. That's all they talk about. And he compares that to what is true riches. Talks about somebody else's property versus your own riches. One day when you go, I've seen people collect stuff. I was sitting in a, in a friend's house the other day. <laughs> I, and I was just open. I mean, we were both just sharing. And he's got this collection of Coca-Cola bottles, tins, everything from all parts of the world. And he's got, he's got a big cabinet filled with Coca-Cola stuff from New York, from London, from everything. He's got a great collection. And it's cool. I said, that's fantastic. And I just said to him, once you're gone, what do you think is going to happen to that? He said, my children probably throw it away. I said, you're absolutely right. They won't even like it. They might sell it, make a little profit, or they might just call somebody, put it in a bin, and it's gone. It's gone. So Jesus speaks very clearly about our perception of God and our perspectives about future. What is going to happen? He said the people of the world, they live a life without God. So they spend their money the way they spend their money. And they enjoy their life because they don't know that there is a God and there's an eternity and there's a judgment and there's waiting before us a God who will welcome us into eternity. So he says, number one, money is a tool. Number two, he says, money is a test. It's a test. Like this woman was asked by her friend, how much did your husband leave you when he died? She said, he left, he left it all. How much did he left it all? So all of us have been given a bit of money and a bit of time and God watches. So Jesus was talking to them and he's saying, if you don't believe that there's an eternity, go ahead and live like this man. He's a wise man. He cheated. He was smart. He made himself secure. Live like that. If you don't believe that there is an eternity. But if you believe that there is an eternity, he said you've been given a little and you've been given a short time and from God's view up in heaven, some of us, our money will continue to remain on this world, but our time will be over. So number one, money is a tool. Number two, money is a test. Thank God for the test. He says, if you can't be faithful in this little worldly riches, how can you have true riches? He mentions all of that. Which do you want? This little bit here and no riches in eternity. Number three, he said, money is a trademark. He taught us that if you manage it well for the glory of God, it's a trademark. Someone once said that the chief competitor of our hearts is our possession, is our money, it's our stuff. We say God is our king, we sing those songs, but really, who's the king of our heart? It's our possession. We polish it, we dust it, we, we, we insure it, we keep it secure, because really, this is very, very important to me. God wants us to prosper. Please understand that. I believe in prosperity. But he wants us to view our wealth the way your heavenly father views it. It's here for a moment. It's, it marks what kind of a person you are. You see people's faces change. People's expression, body language. The Pharisees, their body language changed. They got upset with Jesus. They berated him because money was their trademark. No money, no talk. And our world lives like that. So Jesus in verse 15 says, you can fool everyone, but you cannot fool God. You can fool everyone by your piousness, but you can't fool God. So this is not a scolding message. This is just for us to get our perspective right. There is an eternity. There is a day of accountability. The Bible tells us in, in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, Every man will give an account before God. Every man. So if you're worried about people keeping an account about you, forget about that. Live for God. Yeah. 
Because you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account for your life, the choices that you made. Amen? So as we close this message today, I want us to change, think, think, think. When you get up tomorrow morning as you go to work, thank God for our jobs. Thank God for the jobs. Your work is different from your job. I've shared that, isn't it? Your work is who you are. It's what your worth is. Go thinking this way. Whatever I have is from God. I'm going to use it wisely. I'm not going to blow it away. I'm not going to be a fool. Jesus never called a person a fool only when they disregarded God. He said the rich man was said, I will build, I will do this, I will do that, I will do this, I've got all the time, I've got all the space, I've got all the resources, I will tear down, I will build up. That night, the angel said to him, you are a fool. Today, you didn't know that it was going to happen. I will require. Now, many people don't like a message like this because it brings you back to reality. Thank God for the life that we have, yeah? I enjoy every day of my life. I thank God. Oh, yes. But I'll never forget to say, you're my shield. You're my rewarder. You're my God. You're my protector. You're my savior. You're my, you're my redeemer. You redeem me from hell. I was on my way to hell. I was going to die without God like a dog. I was going to be like a heathen, cast away. But you redeemed me. You forgave me. You forgave me. You healed me. You strengthened me. You blessed me. You blessed me. No way on earth I could be where I am today. I was just a young boy from Penang. But by the grace of God, you saved me. You, you kept me from falling. I made many mistakes. But somehow, you defended me. I keep saying that to God. Even when I'm in the shower, I'll be saying, you are my defense. You are my Lord. Because I really, my perception of God, my perspective about eternity is very clear. I don't want to blow it. So when I write to my son-in-laws, you treat your wife well. Make sure you have a good marriage. I send them taxes, my, my son-in-laws. I never had sons, but I thank God for son-in-laws. And I write to my daughters, you love your husband. You treat him well. Cook well. Live well. Enjoy your life. But in everything, learn to serve God with all your heart. You have a limited opportunity and limited amount of money. No matter how rich you think you are, you have a limited, from heaven's perspective, you've got a limited amount of money. You might go before your money finishes. Time goes by so fast. So live it well. Live it for God. Live it for the glory of God. And Jesus said that in Luke chapter 16 as he was bringing it to a close for the message that he was speaking about perspectives. How you see God. He loves you. He forgives you. He runs after you. But he will also hold you accountable for the time and the finances that he has given to us. Amen? So you need to thank God for your job. For those of you who are studying, thank God your parents sent you. Some of you who are studying here, thank God your parents at least worked hard to finance you. Thank God you got a limited time. Do well. This is not the time for you to go out and blow yourself in parties on, on Saturday night that you can't get up and come on Sunday. Don't be a fool. You've got a short time. Finances are very important. Your parents work hard to send you on your way. Do well. Succeed. Yeah. Succeed. Make them proud of you. And if you know how to be faithful in this little worldly riches, God says he will entrust to you what is true riches. What is true riches that money cannot buy. Love and peace and family and blessings and honor and promotion that money cannot buy. You want to be a playboy? Go ahead and do it. But you lose all that opportunity to have what is true riches. What is true riches? That comes from God. Ah, that's the one that God protects and he will make sure he releases it to you step by step at the stage of your life. He knows how to bless you. He knows how to send you on your worldwide holidays. He knows how to promote you. He knows how to make you stay in some of the best hotels. He knows how to make sure you own some of the nicest. You don't have to chase these things. You be faithful in what he has given you, your time and your finances. Then he will know how to release little. You think he's a stingy father? He's a loving heavenly father. He wants to bless you above and beyond. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be like the people of this world. So that guy in that parable was afraid. What am I going to do? So he did his best to protect, cover himself. He did his, and Jesus complimented him. He said, you should be thinking like that. This time that you have is short. 
Because your father is going to release to you true riches. True riches comes from God. And that can never be stolen by thieves. It can never be rusted. The world's finances may go up and go down. And people commit suicide because of their insecurity in the world of finance in this world. But who will release to you when times are bad? True riches. Who will release to you when things are bad and when the finances drop to the bottom and you realize all my money I invested in this and it's gone? Today, it's a big lesson, especially in our country. People's eyes are being opened in Malaysia like never before. All right? But for us as Christians, we take it one step further. No matter how great our country can become, tomorrow it can drop. It can fall just like that. But he who is faithful in what is someone else's, God says, I will give you what is really yours. That's what Jesus was teaching. So I hope you'll go home, or maybe during lunchtime, just read through Luke 16, and let it bathe your soul, the words of Jesus. Change your perspective about how you are going to be living your life the next few years from now. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's pray. Jesus. Amen. Lift your hands right where you're standing. Father, I just thank you for these people. Thank you for the work that you've done in their lives. Thank you that you take away our anxiety and our fear and our nervousness about the future. Because as your children, we know we have a future. We know that you've got a plan for us. We know that you have got good things true riches you will entrust to us you ask us that question who will entrust to you true riches we know only you have the power to send to us that true riches not only in eternity but also here while we work hard and we do life thank you that you are our provider amen amen so I pray that you will make some choices today in your heart, that you will really get serious about God. You've got a limited time, limited amount of finances. I thought it was very big, but compared to the person sitting next to me, it's nothing. And compared to, to eternity, with eternal perspective from God's view, and when God sees things, it's so small. I mean, we look at our stars and we think, wow, the galaxy and the world, it's so big. And people keep thinking, are there beings in other planets? And then they keep realizing there's none. There's this little blue marble called Earth. And they are the only people there. And like God like wasted all these riches and surrounded us with all these stars. And there's nothing there. That's how God is so rich. All right? He owns everything. Change your perspective. Don't think of God as a small God. Maybe you came from a small-minded family. Maybe things were tough at home. And everything had to be scraped and saved. And, and I understand that. We all come from different backgrounds. Oh, but I tell you something. You need to change your perspective. Lord, renew our minds. Renew our minds. <laughs> yeah. Some of us, we need our minds changed. We need to sit down and have a bigger view of God. Maybe you came from backgrounds, I, I deal with that with people from Pakistan all the time. That their mindset is like impossible. We are refugees. We are refugees in Malaysia. So therefore, we will always be refugees. So I have to challenge that mindset every Sunday when I speak for them. Whenever I speak for I don't speak for them every Sunday. But when I mix with the pastors and when I deal with the leaders, I have to challenge their perspective. Don't think like that. I say, you can become a great businessman in Malaysia if you learn how to change your perspective, order your life well, live your life well, be truthful, be honest. People will like you. They want to hire you. And from being, from being a paid person, you can slowly set aside. And I change that perspective. Oh, I can own a business. And one of them just got their own car. I mean, he was a refugee. Pastor, I got my own car. So what are you going to do with it? I'm going to bring people to church. Correct answer. Absolutely correct. I said, from here, 
you'll what? You'll start owning businesses. Change, change your thinking. I got a car. Oh, very good. So you got a car. I never, my grandfather never drove a car in Pakistan. My father never drove a car. I got a car. He said I took selfies and sent it to my home in Pakistan. And my whole family were cheering for me. I said, good for you, fantastic. What are you going to do with the car? We're going to bring people to church. Good answer. So the whole parable of Jesus was, what are you going to use worldly riches for? Use it to throw your connect group. Just now, Pastor Sam was talking about CG and Fudzi came and came up here and shared. I'm going to use my money to, 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 to. Is it Fudzi? Fudzi. Not Mudzi, not. Be quiet, Sat told me. Fudzi. I'm going to build my connect group. But it's only limited finances compared to what? God's true riches? Compared to eternity? You've got a short time, an opportunity. Use it or lose it. I want to challenge you to use it. Amen? Yeah, God's going to bless all of you. Every single one of you. You guys just got married, moved into your new home, lost your job. Have you found anything yet? Yes. Really? One day you're smiling like that. Yeah. So God's going to bless you more. More and more and more. Just watch it coming. I love it. More and more and more. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's why when she lost her job, you know, and then of course she just got one. But she was saying things like, I don't know why I'm not stressed. I don't know why I'm at peace. See, that's a person who knows true riches. Because her peace with God she didn't miss church and miss prayer meeting. She showed up. That's true riches. Money cannot buy. So God now can entrust him in true riches. Because you knew how to handle worldly wealth. Worldly wealth. Amen. Lord, I need you. Let's sing it together.